okay, it does look that there are any more people on the way in, so I think we could that we could start. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this session about GitOps and GitOps in action with a small demonstration in the end. Uh, my name is Jimmy, I work as a cloud architect at Merit Cloud in, in Malmö. I specialize primarily in AWS and Google Cloud. And uh, lately I've been working a lot with DevOps and CICD pipelines at uh, IKEA. So let's start by defining the difference here. We're talking about DevOps and GitOps. What's, what's the big deal and what's the difference really? Um, DevOps is about people. Uh, it's about how we are bringing <coughs> development team, operations team, uh, security team together uh, at one, as one team and they're not as a separate silos. GitOps is more of the movement of enabling CICD. Uh, it's a way of working, so it's more of a technical uh, perspective and more of a tool set than DevOps. So DevOps is about people and the GitOps is more about technology and different techniques. What's the basic of GitOps? Uh, GitOps, we have Git as a single source of truth. Everything we have, we put it in Git. And with that, we get the built-in audit trail that comes with Git. We know what happened, when it happened, and who did it. Pull, requ pull requests are the heart and soul in the GitOps. Basically, anyone can do an operation and the production change as long as you know how to open a pull request. Infrastructure as code is one really, really important part of GitOps. Um, without modeling our infrastructure in code, that's no way for us to automatically set everything up, to spin up new environments over and over again, tear them down and put them back up in the same, exactly the same way. Automation, as I said, if you're going to build environments up and down all the time, you need to automate that. You can't do that in a manual fashion over and over. That would be time consuming and guaranteed that there would be errors. If I hand manual instructions to 150 people, I will get 150 different looking environments. As I said, everything is code. Everything is code. And we put it in Git. The infrastructure is code. Here we can use, uh, if we deploy into AWS, we can use CloudFormation, we can use uh, 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 any other tooling out there, Terraform, serverless framework, or whatever favorite infrastructure as code tool we have. Um, we put our configurations as code. All our configuration files should exist, defined, and version control in it. So if we have different parameters for dev environments, test environments, and production environments, we put them in configuration files and we store them in Git. Documentation. We put the documentation with the code, with the application, in Git. Uh, it's easy to find. Uh, it's easy to keep up to date, or at least easier to keep <laughs> up to date, uh, than if you had it on, on a wiki page somewhere, because when you do a change to the code, it's easy to relate back to the documentation that's just next to the code. So we put everything as code and we put everything in Git and we version control it. Except for secrets. Um, we don't put secrets in Git, so now don't go home. Start working on a project and say, hey, I, I looked at this guy at KDS, and he said we should put everything in Git, and you start checking in your passwords. No. <laughs> Keep your secrets out of Git, of course. Um, put them in a secure vault. HashiCorp vault, AWS Secrets Manager, you, you name it. Use your favorite call tool, and just put references in Git, so you know what password to pull, and 
how to put it down. So I don't want to see any any secrets. Uh, no AWS secret tokens as well, etc. So how do we get started with GitHub Gen? Well, everything starts with Git. Sounds easy enough, right? Uh, we put everything in Git, and we should put even our POCs in Git. Um, there is a company called Datree. Uh, the CEO is named Shimon. And I have <coughs> talked to him and met him a couple of times, a really great guy. And he told a story once um, about their problems with this. They created a new feature for their platform, a really fantastic new cool feature. They enabled it just to try it out. And they tested it in production and found out that, hey, this was really popular and people thought it was a really great feature. Let's turn it on for everyone, which they did. And a couple of weeks later, they discovered that, oh, wait a minute, we did all of this manually. It was just supposed to be a quick, quick try. And they had nothing now in Git. So now we had to start backtracking everything, starting version controlling it, adding it to Git, making sure they had their infrastructure in Git, and then tear it down and redeploy everything. So if you have the possibility to put your even your PCs in um, and make sure you automate that even, even that. We should make sure that we model everything in code for our infrastructure. We model our service in infrastructure as code, we model our serverless features, our Lambda functions, our Azure functions, whatever we have, we model everything in code. And we should do that even when it's hard. Um, we were working on an interesting project at Sony many years ago. And we wanted to put, we, we had this concept from the beginning, make sure that we had everything, we need, make sure that they had everything as infrastructure as code. What we were using, we were using Amazon Cognito and we were using their user pools to manage our users. And what we wanted to do was to do a change. We wanted to do a change on, on the user pool. The problem is that all configuration for the user pools are immutable, meaning that we couldn't just update the part we wanted to update. So the way we had to do it was to pull down the entire configuration file, do the change, and then push the entire configuration once again. And we had to do that over and over again, and there was no support from AWS CloudFormation for this. Meaning that we couldn't model it. The support was lacking. And as a manual task, it would be click, 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 down. So it was came, became really close that we actually put this as manual steps. Um, but in the end, we walked the extra mile and we created our own our own extensions to CloudFormation to be able to handle this in an automatic way. And when we spun up the third environment in, in one week, we were really glad we did. Otherwise it would be um, a pain to remember to do it every time. To be able to also to be able to automate everything, we need to have it modeled as infrastructure as code. We can't, we can't model anything if it's a manual click. That's really hard. So for automation to work, it must be modeled as code. I'm talking about the automation. I found this picture yesterday. And I found it really fun. Um, and it's fine to do something in, in a <laughs> sandbox, but if you want to deploy it to production, you need some decent automation. Um, that's a drawing called Fast and the Furious by Forrest Brassell. He published his cartoons uh, once a week at least. So. Uh, no, but we're talk talking about automation. What we don't want to do, we don't want to do manual deploys. We don't want to do 
SSH in, into a server to update our packages. We don't want to do anything like that. We want to do it automatically every time we do a new build. We don't want to do it manually. And even more important, our automation must work flawless. I, I worked, uh, my previous employer, we had created our own automation framework. We have created our own infrastructure as two code framework. Fantastic tools. Um, they were really useful. The problem in my team was that when we tried to spin up a new environment, around 75% of the times it didn't work. There was something breaking that, that prevented us from spinning up the entire environment so we have to manually go in and tweak something to have the environment run. The problem with that was that there were only like two people who knew exactly how to do that and, and really knew how to get an environment up and running and that led to two things that those two people were really stressed because when anyone wanted a new environment they had to do the work so they were really choked with just setting up new environments and it also ended up that people started treating their environments as pets and not as cattle. So they nurse them, they take care of them, they, they really pet them. Instead of just kill it off, bring up a new one. Um, and that led to that we had too many environments because someone who needed an environment two, three months ago doesn't need it anymore but still cost money because they don't want to tear it down because it would be really hard to get a new so really, really important that if you, when you build your automation, make sure it works all the time, over and over and over again. So you don't have to end up in this situation where you end up with a bottleneck with two people. As I said, pull requests. Pull requests are the heart and soul of everything. You do operation changes by opening a pull request. With that, you get the code review part, you get the colleagues to look at your work, you can easily find the, the low-hanging fruits that all the easy mistakes you've done. I say use pull requests even for critical change. Even if you have 10 managers jumping up and down, screaming at you, saying, get it in, get it in, get it in. Open a pull request, make sure that someone else will use it, because when you're stressing out like that, you make a simple mistake that can be caught by a second pair of eyes. So I would say always pull requests. GitOps is operations by pull requests, it's not operations by force push to master. Um, one way to, to prevent having the managers jumping up and down telling you to force push to master is of course to put rules on the master branch saying you can't do that. You have to go through a pull request. Then they can jump up or down how much they want. You can just say, say that the tool doesn't allow me. Um, and that is the way we normally set it up. We set it up that you need to go via pull request to merge to master. And you, the one that opens the pull request, cannot approve it. We have set up the tools to prevent that, meaning that someone else must review it, otherwise it won't get in. And that helps us even in the most critical situation that we can find easy, easy problems. Uh, drift. Um, I know in a perfect world we wouldn't have drift. Uh, the environment we set up using automation, using our infrastructure's code, using GitOps should be exactly as it's modeled. There shouldn't be any differences in, in the production environment versus the uh, infrastructure's code. But that's in a perfect world. Uh, I know it can happen. Um, it could be different reasons it happens. It could be someone logging on to a production server doing some manual stuff. Um, probably not to be evil, but hey, I wanted to fix it fast and then suddenly it started having drift. So what we need to do is be able to detect it. We need to be able to detect if something starts to drift. Most tools have support for it. Uh, Terraform has support for it, CloudFormation has support for it. You can do drift detecting and you can 
detected, okay, something's wrong here. Next step would be to remediate everything. Um, how do we solve the problem? Is it just like, okay, um, we just redeploy and it will be all good? Or do we need to update our infrastructure in, in our code and then deploy? Um, that depends, of course, uh, on the situation, what to do and how to solve it. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that we get the map and the real world to be similar again. Um, one way to start eliminating some of the possibilities to drift is, of course, to keep humans away from production. If no one has right access to production, they can't do any changes. And basically, why do we have, need to have manual access, right access to production? Read access should be enough. Since we deploy everything automatically via Git, we don't need to have right access. So keep humans away from prod, make sure they don't only have read access, that would solve one problem. Um, it doesn't solve problem if you have flaws in our automation that we have a deploy that goes wrong, that doesn't work back as it should, and stuff like that. So in that case, we need to detect and we need to read. CICD, um, when working with GitOps, I like to work with temporary environments temporary apps, review apps, call it what you want. Um, basically, we spin up a new version based on the pull request, and we can test that environment, we can test that application, we can run automatic tests, we can do, run UI tests, um, everything towards that environment. And um, when we're happy, we can run the pull request. With GitOps, we come actually with two flavors of CICD. We have the push-based flavor, which is the most common one that most people work with, meaning that you have your CICD pipeline pushing your changes to your production environment. And then you have the pull-based version, which is basically where you have your CICD pipeline just building artifacts and tagging artifacts, and then you have uh, an operator in your different environments that starts to pull down the new features. So basically, uh, classic push-based CICD would look like something like that. You have a change in Git, our build pipeline picks that up, builds our artifact, our deploy pipeline picks up the artifact and pushes it to, to our environment if that is a QA environment or a fraud environment. But in, in a pull-based scenario, we would basically have something like this, that we have our CD pipeline just building things, storing in the, in the artifact store. And we have our operators that is running inside our environment that pulls down the change and deploys it. I think this pattern comes with one great benefit, and that is that our CD, CICD pipeline don't need to have access to our production environment. In this case, the production environment only has access to itself. The test environment only has access to, it, to itself. You can't deploy to, to the correct environment by having a flaw in your CICD pipeline because it's the environment itself that does the deployment. And you can only deploy to its own environment. You can't do cross deployments. This doesn't work when you work with temporary environments because there is no environment are running that can pull the change. So in that case, I like to work with, with what I call a combo-based CICD, meaning for temporary environments or review apps, I do a push. So I let my deploy pipeline push to a new temporary application or environment that I can test. And when I'm happy with that, the build pipeline takes over and just builds the artifact, and the operator pattern takes over and deploys it to the real environment. This is a, a really strong pattern that we're trying to implement currently at IKEA. Um, we work a lot with temporary environments. Uh, we today works with uh, two different tools, actually. We work with 
Bitbucket and we work with Azure DevOps. Um, so what we do in force is working with temporary environments with new apps to make sure that we can review UI changes and things like that. And then we try to implement the operator pattern. We're not really there yet, but we're on our way at least. So to be able to handle this in a good way, actually in my own projects, I built JBot. Uh, JBot is my GitOps coordinating tool, running out of AWS, 100% serverless, not one single virtual machine running for this flow. And what it does is uh, coordinate everything for me. So, first of all, I have a flow when I open up a new pull request. So, when I developer or mostly myself, since I built it for my private project that we're not trying to, to use, uh, opens up a pull request that triggers an event in the system. And here I'm using Amazon Event Bridge. I detect the pull request and I trigger up an Amazon step function. The step function is a coordination for Lambda functions. And those Lambda functions start to do interesting things. Um, what they do is that they first of all comment on the pull request, saying that they have detected the pull request and that a new build has been started. It kicks off of my build. Here I'm using AWS code build. You Basically, the tool doesn't care. Uh, right now, it's using code build, and it, you can only configure it code build, but you could be using anything you like here, uh, because the build part is done by the application. It's not done by JBot. It's done by the application, since that's what's you known how to build builds. Um, here, the code build actually creates a new temporary environment using CloudFormation. So that spins up a new environment for me that I can try out and test. When the build completes, that fires off a new event into the Amazon Event Bridge, and we fire off a new step function that can start commenting back once again to the pull request. What it does is that it brings, pulls out the URL to the temporary environment from the code build uh, and posts that in, in, into the pull request. By doing that, it's really easy for other people working with it to just click on the link and they end up in the type environment. And this is exactly how we do it at IKEA today. We come back all the temporary environments to the pull requests, so it's easy to just go in and click. So every developer, business per person, UX, and everyone can just access that temporary environment. I then have the flow when the pull request closes. Um, once again, this fires off things in Amazon Event Bridge. And I like my step functions, so I fire off them once again. And it does two different things here. If it's a merge, meaning that we have now accepted the change, we merged, it, merged this one to master, I trigger uh, a build that starts building an artifact. And I trigger a different build that actually tears down the old temporary environment because that one is not needed anymore. If we close it because we discard the change, we don't want to do it anymore, uh, we destroy just destroy the temporary environment. We don't do any build. When the build completes, um, Amazon Event Bridge once again fires off, and a step function pulls out the artifact from the build and stores it. Today it stores it in Amazon S3 only. Here we could be using anything, it could be any Docker registry, it could be anything you like to store your artifacts in. And for deploying a new version here, a new artifact is detected by Lambda function, and that triggers off a deployment. And this part runs inside your environment. So here we deploy to either a QI environment or a production environment, but we can't do a cross deploy. So here we have the pool based pattern running.
you could use any tool you like. I built it myself because I, I really wanted the control and wanted to have it. Um, we are building basically the same way and the same patterns using uh, uh, Bitbucket pipelines today and migrating those to Azure DevOps to have basically the same way of working. The talk is GitOps in action, so we need to have an act in action part, of course. So we're going to run a small demo. Um, what we're going to do is gonna, we're going to see Git, uh, JBot in action. We're going to open a pull request, and we're going to see the flow. We're going to see the commenting. We're going to see deployments to temporary environments, and we're going to see deployments to test environment and production environments. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, we are a new and cool startup. And we are a unicorn rental company. So we own unicorns and we rent them out. Oops, maybe too large. Um, today we only have one unicorn. It's Luna, and she has a special feature that she has wings and can fly. But we found a one more unicorn that we can, could catch in the magic forest, and we want to rent that out as well. So we need to add that to our data. Uh, checking our, this is our um, REST API. So we only have a get function, and this is our test environment, and it just retu returns one unicorn. It returns Luna, and she has wings. So now we need to do this. So <clears throat> I prepared something. Uh, I am, have already created a branch for this. Um, Um, I am using Amazon Code Commit as my repository. I have my unicorns demo, and I have already created a new branch called Commit here. So I have my master branch that is my default branch, and I have created a, a KDS branch already. So. We add one more unicorn then. And I was too lazy to have a database, so we're running it out of JSON instead. Um, we caught our unicorn called Gaia. And her special feature is speed. She's really, really fast, so if you want to race, it's a perfect, perfect, correct thing. Um, See, is the font okay? Shall I increase it more? Okay. Uh, so, make sure I'm on the KDS branch, which I, which I am. So, we just add that one. And we commit it. And we push it up to our repository. That, of course. So we are now have now pushed it up to our repository. So let's go get over here. <coughs> and what we want to do now is open a pull request for this. So in this tool, I just click create pull request. I select KDS branch as my. And here I can see my change. You can see that I added Gaia and with this feature of speed. So just add a description. And we create. So 
Now JBot, JBot kicks in and starts working. What we first will have is this part here running JBot pull request open. And we would will see in our code build parts that we will have a build running for this. Pull request build. We should be having a pro build in progress, which we have. Uh, takes around one and a half minutes to deploy up this new new uh, environment. So let's get back to the code commit. And this is my pull request that I just opened. So I will click on activity, and I can see that JBot has added a pull a comment that we now have one, a build running uh, with a specific ID comes from code build in this part. So we just wait until we have everything repeated. I should have shorter build times. Improve my times. Yes. For for. Small unicorns. Small unicorns, yeah. That's why you call it speed. <laughs> <laughs> and like it's been one minute, 40 seconds. Should be done. Yeah, build is done. Perfect. And um, let's go back here to our pull request. You refresh that one. And we now see that code build of some, for some reason reports an unknown build state. Um, should report success because it was a success. Uh, I, we uh, get links directly to the logs and we get links to the uh, test environment. However, I need to copy that. And we go here and let's open the test environment. And we see that in my test environment I now have two. I have Luna and I have Gaia, but if I refresh my test environment, I still see that I still only have one. So we have created a new environment. We are happy with this. Perfect. Did exactly what we wanted. We are happy. So let's merge it. I like to keep my branch. Uh, we do a fast forward merge, basic straight out of the box. And we merge. So now we close the pull request. This will now trigger JBot once more, and we will have a new build running. In this case, now we are only building the artifacts. We are not deploying anything to any environment because that we will pull, pull down later. So what we have now is that we had. Uh, Unicorn's demo build probably running, and it's been running for 16 seconds. It takes around 30 seconds to build this one. And when that happens, it's done, we will have a new artifact. Stored in our test bucket here. So here test environment and we have our new artifact so we have a new artifact the test environment detects that jbot detects that we now practice uh, did create a new artifact and publish that to the test or the qi environment directly so jbot will once again trigger off a lot of things and it will start deploying so we should have now a deploy running here. So what we have now is the deploy to our QI environment running. We have created a new artifact. We have detected it. We deemed it for test. And then the operator in the test environment has now detected that and started to, to deploy to the test environment. 
that one takes around 40 seconds, since it's a simple update. 43 seconds, perfect. Now so we can go back here. This is our test environment. Uh, oh, sorry, our demo environment. We have closed the merge and pull request. It should now be destroyed. So, fingers crossed, if I refresh, I get the forbidden. Perfect. The environment is gone. Um, so let's go <laughs> to my test environment. Let's refresh it, and voila, press Yari. Uh, everything here is done through one pull request. We open the pull request, we approve the pull request, and we have everything without a single human intervention running in our test environment. Just to see that I don't fool you, this is our production environment. <coughs> and here we don't have anything. We still only have the old version. The new version is now running our QA environments. We can do extensive more tests. And when we are happy with this, we deploy it to production. So let's do that. We deploy it to production. I deploy to production by making sure I move the artifact to the production uh, as ma markets as the production and, and um, production ready artifact and there are numerous ways you can do that um, I do it by just copying it to, to my S3 bucket um, if you're using an artifact store like Azure Artifacts or um, JFrog or something like that you would probably use tag so when you added a new tag to, to an artifact Prod, it will detect that and deploy it. So let's paste my artifact in here. Okay, we're ready. I've, I've started deploying now. Let's deem this artifact production ready. This will once again kick off JBot, and we should have a new deployment running. Yeah, we have. So we now are deploying to production. Uh, and this code will... It was the copy that uh, yep. triggered yep. Yeah. it was a copy that triggered it. So when I put the artifact in, in the new S3 bucket, it will fire off an event that, that is picked up by Lambda function that, that informs the operator in, in this environment that there is a new artifact run. Um, if you're using like an artifact store, you would probably have had a virtual machine the, the, the calling for new tags if you come to... Uh, notification on that. If you can notify, it's of course better because calling over and over again will be burning CPU cycles. So, we have a succeeded build. This is our production environment. It's refreshing. And we have a new deployment. Um, oh, okay, you see, perfect. Uh, just to recap what we did now. What we have done is we did a change. In this case, we, we found a new unicorn. Uh, we opened up a pull request for this new change. And after that, we had basically no human intervention. We created a, te a temporary environment where we could check out our change, make sure it was running perfectly. We merged that one and had an automatic deployment to our QI environment. Uh, when I'm using my tool JBot here, uh, I had put up a configuration to, to, uh, to inform that tool, okay, what is the next, when when a merge happens, what environment should I automatically deploy to, if any? So I would, I would configure it to automatically deploy to the QA environment. We could test out everything once again in, in the QA environment, the test environment, and when we're ready, ready, we promoted the artifact to production here by copying it to an um, S3 bucket. And we had a deployment of the, the unicorn to production. That's all for me.
Thank you. Follow me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, read my blog, and uh, questions. You could have automated the copy too. Right? Yeah. Um, if you wanted to have an automatic deployment, like, okay, automatically deploy to Q QA, and when that is done, automatically deploy to, um, to production as well. You could have automated the copy as well. Um, what I wanted here was to have, have that break. I want to deploy to QA and I want to do more testing before I do, do promote it to production. But yeah, of course, you can, you can deploy it all the way if you like that. Sure. Uh, do you have any plans of open sourcing? Yes, I do. Um, this tool will be open sourced in a couple of weeks. Uh, I will be speaking at the AWS Community Day in Stockholm on January 31st, so that Friday. Uh, so I will do this presentation again uh, with a twist, because then we will do it with voice instead. Three unicorns, and we will deep do uh, do things with voice instead. So we will use Amazon Alexa, uh, and after that, I will uh, open source it. Yeah, you will find I use the same uh, pronoun for, for GitHub. Jimmy DQV, you can find my GitHub, and there is some stuff already. Sure. <laughs> the The operator here was the Lambda function. Uh, JBot is an entire coordination tool, and, and part of that is a small part of that is operator JBot, and that was. Yeah, so that's what, that's what the question is: Do you get the nature of that operator actually resides? The operator resides inside your uh, environment. Uh, it lives inside your test environment, the QA environment. So it's not part of the CI/CD pipeline, so it's running in that environment. So. Here I almost, from a demo perspective here, I was only using one AWS account. Um, otherwise I would have to switch between AWS accounts, so that would be really painful. Uh, but what you could have is that you have your test environment running in one AWS account, and you have a production environment running in a different AWS account. So then you would have one operator running in each of those accounts, and, and they, they can only deploy to that account. So, but in this demo I have, uh, I didn't want to use multiple accounts because that would only make things more complicated. The slides? Yeah. Is it the central way or should we get it from you? I think they will be distributed after the conference. Um, if I remember all information correctly, they should be. Otherwise, I can throw them up on SlideShare or something like that. I also get the handle. What? I also get your handle. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, just connect with me and, and send me a message if you want to start. Okay. Uh, concerning updating the operator, you use the operator to update the operator? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't really mention that, uh, and I should have. Um, your CI CD pipeline should be version controlled in Git as well. Um, that should be part of your, all of that. Updating operator, should I use operator to update the operator? Uh, if you manage to do that, that's really new, not neat pattern, I think. Um, I'm not doing that, actually. Um, when, I, I, when I update the, the operator, since I'm using a Lambda function, um, it, it will be updated as soon as I deploy that, redeploy that Lambda function. Um, it would be really cool to, to update the operator with the operator. I need to try that out. <laughs> No, definitely not. Uh, the operator you will need to build yourself. Uh, if you're running in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you have to create this operator. Kubernetes already have some form of operator pattern, so it's really easy to hook into that. But no, it's not, it's not there in any platform. You, you need to build it yourself. Um, and I often get the question, oh, but I, we can't do temporary environments because we are running these huge Kubernetes clusters. Well, create create a temporary Kubernetes cluster that always lives, and then use like namespaces and things like that to route your traffic. Uh, but no, you need to build operator definitely, uh, and 
the actual building part, how to, to build the artifact and things like that. That is nothing that JBot in this case takes care of because that's a generic tool. It doesn't know how your application is built. That's why I'm using code build here. So I'm only telling JBot, please trigger this build in this step. And that build knows exactly how to package it. Yes, it's more secure if you have if you have encrypted your secret and checked that it did it, uh, and then you have your secret key stored somewhere else to decrypt it. Yes, that is from a security standpoint. I would say yeah, that is okay. But I think it's it's problem with it is its rotations. If you want to rotate your password, uh, that's more harder to do if you have it in in, um, in code. Uh, from a security perspective, yeah, I don't think it's a problem. Um, then it's more of a management problem. You really need to rotate our passwords once every month. And in, in that case, how do we do that? And many secure walls have automatic rotation and things like that. And can do it for you. Right. I need to say that from a human perspective, and um, it's asking for mistakes later on during the development. Yep. Uh, question about Git. You're saying that uh, everything into Git makes up yeah. secrets. Yeah. And for a single Git repository? No. Nope. It's clear. It's clear. If you um, like. I, I don't have. Ooh, that's a different discussion. Monorepo versus multi-repo, and I'm not going to touch that one. Uh, there are so many opinions about that. Uh, if you like to use monorepo, do it. Uh, the tool I have built cannot handle monorepo. I, I, I can only handle uh, multiple repos, meaning that you run uh, one deploy per, per repo. I can't distinguish. If you run a monorepo, uh, you have to create a tool to detect what service you are doing the change to and things like that. So no, there's no nothing saying that you need one uh, I'm using one repo here because it's easier from a demo perspective. Um, I, I like multiple repos. <laughs> and I work in projects that we have uh, uh, up to 40 different services running in 40 different repositories and, and that's manageable. I know that people are running 20 and think it's pain in the ass in order to do a mono repo. That's a different, different discussion. It's so opinionated that I'm not even touching that one. You could extend the question to a loss of configuration settings. Configuration settings? Yeah, for different environments that you're having. Yeah, it, I, I put uh, each configuration together with the service. So if we have multiple repos and each service needs different configuration, that configuration lives in the same repository. We don't have a central repository for configurations. Of course you can do that as well. It's all about, that's more of a team question and a developer question, how, how we like to work with things. From a tooling perspective, that's nothing that prevents you from doing all configurations in one repository versus having it spin up. More of a how do we like to work? No more questions? Great. Don't forget to vote on your way out. The green button. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.